I just think we ought to wait till after you graduate. I don't. It's only a month. Janet, a month. Please. Sorry. I personally consider us engaged as of now. Congratulations. David, no. Look, you can say yes in a taxi. I have a 2.30 appointment I'm staying right here. Oh, afraid you'll say yes? I'll see you tonight at Brandon's Park. Okay. You can say yes, sir, just as well as in a taxi. Goodbye, darling. Bye. That's the last time she ever saw him alive. And that's the last time you'll ever see him alive. What happened to David Kentley changed my life completely and the lives of seven others. Janet Walker, Henry Kentley, the boy's father, his aunt, Mrs. Atwater, his best friend, Kenneth Lawrence, a housekeeper named Mrs. Wilson, and the two who were responsible for everything, Brandon Shaw and Philip Morgan. Mouse. Which is the cat and which is the mouse? It's another one. I'll take care of you. Won't. I'd just as soon kill you as kill him. Everybody, welcome back to Rote Reviews. I'm S.A. Baz Collins and my co-host Van Sebastian. And today we're doing something a little different. Um, we're going to use one film in particular to drive our point home for this episode, but we are really talking about queer-coded films, primarily in this case of Alfred Hitchcock. Um, Alfred Hitchcock, for those who don't know, and you had to live under a rock not to know at least the name, I'm sure even the children who have never watched one of his films may have uh, heard his name. So they may understand when you see thrillers and they always compare it and they say this was a very Hitchcockian movie. That's who they're referring to is Alfred Hitchcock, the great auteur director. You were going to say? Okay. Um, so I am... A Hitchcock buff. I have many books on the man. I know the man's life story backwards and forwards. I know all the dark tales and the twisted things he used to do on set. Photobomb for my cat. Um, twisted things he used to do on set. Um, the man truly had a very, very twisted sense of humor. He was a very complicated man. Um, to kind of give you a reason why, when he was eight, he did something really kind of naughty, being a naughty little boy. And his father, to teach him a lesson, talked the police in locking him up for a day in jail at eight years old. Henceforth, all of Hitchcock's movies have a strong distrust of the authorities. So it's a common theme that runs throughout his movies. This um, one doesn't. Well, you never get to them. No, I know, but that's just it. They're called. Yes, for help. but there's a, there's a reason why, we'll, and we'll get to that. Okay. So what people need to understand is that Hitchcock loved to break molds. Hitchcock is seen as probably one of the most innovative directors of his era, starting from the silent films and then coming into the modern era through the 70s up until just before he died in 1980. Um, the thrust of his work are thrillers, although he did do a musical 
a comedy and a period melodrama, costume drama that are not thrillers. He was talked into those. Um, Carol Lombard talked him in, who was his one of his best friends, talked him into directing Mr. and Mrs. Smith for her. Um, and so he ended up doing a, a screwball comedy, rom-com, that, you know, really wasn't, uh, a, uh, it wasn't really his forte, and it kind of shows his directing is rather lackluster. And it, the humor's there, but it's just, you know, it's Hitchcock, but it's not Hitchcock. Do, um, do we need to the preface thing, people by saying this is not the Brad Jelena version? Yeah, it's, just not, it's not the Bradgelina version. Um, in fact, that was a remake of that one, but they went full on action hero, rom com right. thing rather than what was in the original. So. The reason why I bring all of this up and the reason why I'm setting the stage is because today we are going to focus on the movie Rope, which is based on a play that was called Rope in England when it pre premiered in the West End in 1929. And it then went to the States on Broadway and was called Rope's End. This has been adapted from Patrick Hamilton's play Rope. And it was adapted by a screenplay writer who later on in life came out as a gay man. But at the time, I guess, was working and wasn't quite out and open about it. And Arthur Lorenz is the screenplay writer's name. Now, he and Hitch had a, wanted to do something different with Rope. Now, you have to understand, at this point in time in Hitchcock's career, he had just come over from England during the late 30s, early 40s. So he was freshly a, a new director, a rising director in the United States at the time. What's interesting is, is that one of his biggest breaks came from David O. Selznick. And Selznick was the producer of Gone with the Wind. He had his hands on a lot of major films in the 40s and 50s. Part of the deal that um, Selznick did for Hitch was that he had to make four pictures for David Selznick under David Selznick's studios. And Rope was ended up being one of them. The problem was David Selznick literally wanted to micromanage every single frame of the movies that Hitchcock was directing for him. So Hitch got it in his head that he wanted to do something unusual with Rope. He wanted to film a movie where it is done in full length reels. And then at the time, film canisters were about 12 minutes, 12 and a half minutes each canister. And his idea was in order to thwart the micromanaging and editing of the film from Selznick, he wanted to record the film in such a way that it was reminiscent of the stage play and that it used what he called invisible cuts. I will put a picture of where those invisible cuts occur because there is a chart that you can find online that shows you exactly where they occur and what time code they're at. So I'll put that up here. Um, the one thing that I loved about the film when I first saw it was I was immediately drawn to the two lead characters, John Dahl playing Brandon Shaw and um, Farley Granger, who I had the biggest gay boy crush on when I was a kid. Oh, I just, I could not get enough of Farley Granger. I searched out every movie I could find on Farley Granger. That, he was my first gay crush. Um, but he, uh, he plays Philip, the boyfriend of, um, of who Brandon is in a relationship with in this film. Now, what the film deals with, it's loosely based on the Leopold and Loeb murders, which were two uh, slightly out of college uh, lovers in the 20s who got caught up in the whole Nietzschean Ubermensch uh, philosophy where there were people who were considered superior and inferior. And this film deals a lot with that Nietzschean concept. And in fact, it's kind of timely in today's realm because we're having these discussions with critical race theory and all of that stuff going on in education. This was very much the same kind of thing. It was the heated buzzwords and eventually led to the Nazi rise, which was a celebration of the Ubermensch um, from Nietzsche. So I, I, we should, this, since you're talking about it, we should preface that in the film, the focus is on intellectual superiority, not racial. Right, 
Right, but it's very, very it's, thinly it, it veiled toes, that it, way. It toes the line, of course. Yes, yes. Um, and it's funny because there's a great line that um, Arthur Lawrence said about the film that captured my attention. And it is exactly, and he uses it, he actually says it in Celluloid Closet, which we did a review of, and I'll put the link up here for it. Um, and he says, what was curious to me was that rope was obviously about homosexuals. The word is never mentioned, not by Hitch, not by anyone at Warner Brothers. It was referred to as it. They were going to do a motion picture about it. And the actors playing the lead characters were it. So Hitch loved this idea. He loved the perverseness of going against the Hayes Code, which was big and sexual perversion was at the top, as you will see in our review of Celluloid Closet. Don't click it now, click it at the end of the thing. But um, sexual perversion was a big, big one on the Hayes Code. It was a no-go and it would get you redlined in the script really fast so they had to be really clever and this is where gay coding comes in for rope and actually there are about four or five movies where hitch did this same queer coding um pushing against the Hayes code the morality uh that was trying to be pushed upon be uh performers and actors and stories um celluloid closet is a big celebration of uncovering lifting the rock on those coded movies of the golden era of Hollywood. And Rope was right in the thick of it. And Hitch's whole thrust was he wanted to play with something that was so against the grain of where modern audiences were, but was coded in such a way that if they didn't know what breadcrumbs were there, they would completely gloss over it. They would never even suspect what was at the heart of this story. So that's the framework for Rope. Um, and in order to get around Selznick's micromanaging, he filmed it in the Invisible Cuts, as I mentioned before, so that the film could only really be cut one way. If you tried to do anything else with it, it would have looked hackneyed. And so it was his way of getting around Selznick's micromanaging of the film. Um, unfortunately, Rope for all of its amazing technical and queer coding accomplishments was not a commercial success. It was actually, it only brought in about just under $3 million worldwide at the time. So it was not one of his biggest films, but I contend personally, I think it's one of his masterpieces of high drama rooted in a real story with queer actors playing queer and being open about it, it is kind of the open secret that's never mentioned. It's never talked about. Everyone just generally accepts the boy's relationship. And most modern audiences of the time in 1948, I think when it came out, um, probably didn't even suspect anything. There's a throwaway line that Brandon uses that many straight audiences could latch on to to push away the thought that Brandon and Philip were a couple in that he says, well, it's hard to keep up with all your bows. You know, first there was me, then Kenneth, and now David. So he throws this line in at Janet. At Janet, yeah. Yes, which kind of straightens out his character. So then you get into question of, well, are they really gay? Well, for all intents and purposes, I can answer that question. Arthur Lorenz, who wrote the screenplay, John Dahl, Farley Granger, and Alfred Hitchcock have all said in media that they were. It was a thing. That's why they called it It. So, it is a queer-coded film. Uh, let's get into the discussion now with all of that stage setting. What did you think about it? I'm going to preface my answer by saying my husband recently made me watch the original Halloween and I have kind of reached the edge of my serial killer intake for a while. So the history of the film, uh, James Stewart plays a professor named Rupert Cadwell, Caddell, excuse me, Caddell. who planted the seed in Brandon that an intellectually superior being could kill another person and it would be okay. 
and the see the film opens with Brandon and Philip killing David. Like the, I'm not spoiling a damn thing. That's the opening scene. It's the first scene in the movie. And if you have watched the preview clip, all right, I guess it was the trailer. Was like the original trailer. It was um, the original trailer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you see David just before he heads over to Brandon and Phillips. So they kill him, stuff him in a chest, and decide to use the chest as the food board for the party they're going to throw for all the people who would have been in David's life happily ever after, including his father and his fiance Janet. Um, it delved deeply into the superiority complex that we see in a lot of serial killers in that they're smart and want to get away with it in front of everyone. And it's some big joke secret. And Brandon, I should say, John Dahl playing Brandon, carried it off really well. You could have placed him in Dexter and he would have been right at home. Um, The one-liners, the little jokes he made about death and, oh, we're going to kill sometime. All of that was in play and very witty and very fun. I just don't know that I needed another serial killer in my life this week. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Um, (laughs) his his husband, not not Jason. (laughs) I just realized that. (laughs) And that's the joke in my house. Thank you very much. (laughs) And that's why he's making me watch that series. Uh Uh-huh. So uh, anyway. That's good. If you want to delve into the mind of a killer as seen through the 1940s lens, this has supreme historic value. The, the gay-coded relationship is there if you look for it. It's all there. Um, and it is beautifully shot, especially with the technical difficulties Hitch gave himself so that it wouldn't be edited any other way. All of that is there. It is a masterpiece. It's just the subject matter. I was not ready for it this week. But you can grade it on its merits. I am, and I did. That. I absolutely did. Okay. So here's the thing that I have to say about the queer coding. Hitchcock, this is this is from a article on Mensa.org written by uh, two really well um, researched uh, authors of this article that is really kind of interesting. It's by Scott Badman and Connie Russell Hosier. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing her last name right. It's one O. Um, not Hoosier. Um, it's just interesting because the opening sequence, the murder that we see, was in Hitch's mind the gay sex scene. Mm-hmm. Um, he coded, and this is from the article, he coded Brandon and Philip as gay by their sex scene. It occurs at the very beginning of the movie, which is also the murder scene. Hitchcock is strongly equating murder with sex. This murder sex occurs between curtain window, behind curtain windows. The death scream corresponds to the orgasm. Now visible, the murderers Brandon and Philip quickly put the body in a cabinet and go into a post-coital exhaustion. Philip doesn't even want the light turned on. It's an inspired touch. Hitchcock has Brandon light a cigarette and a standard Hollywood indicator for we just had sex. And what I love about it, the things, the things I loved about Rope more than anything is the slow, this is a slow train wreck of a film. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, does not have a happy ending for anyone involved. Nope. Uh, yeah, I, I, I just, uh, and what's interesting also, um, the only character that, whose sexual orientation was changed from the original work was Rupert Cadell, played by James Stewart. And in fact, James Stewart says he believed he was miscast in the film and thought another actor who could have played the gay angle along with Granger and Dahl would have made the film better. So Mm -hmm. Stewart's on record for saying that himself. Because in the play, both Brandon and Philip had had an affair with Rupert when they were in school. Yeah, I mean, that... That, it's, it's, it's alluded Rupert, to Rupert's character's disdain for uh, normalcy is even even James Stewart plays that part up. So yes, it, that does. wasn't a stretch for me to see that that was there in their past. I, I yeah, actually but, had but them have most, stra- most straight audiences probably would have not and they would not have accepted it of James Stewart. Also true. Also true. Yeah. So that's that's kind of you. It's kind of like imagining Jason Momoa playing a fa- flaming homosexual. Yeah, he could probably pull it off. He's a talented enough actor, but 
the audience wouldn't go there. They just I wouldn't won't. buy it. I wouldn't yeah. buy it. That's what I'm saying. So it, it, it's kind of on that level. When you think of James Stewart saying what he said about his own work, it really is with the context of he was already an established straight male romantic lead actor. True. And that audiences would not have gone there. But he thinks that it, the film suffered for it. He, th he thought that it actually probably, he was been cast and somebody else who could have played that angle, even ever so slightly, might have carried the film a little bit better and served it better. So I think that's I rather know. interesting. I actually think he delivered the eye contact to both Philip and Brandon in such a way that I, I would have, I absolutely thought there was a past between them. I, right. I, and I think what's interesting is when you watch the, the trio, Brandon, mm -hmm. Philip, and Rupert, you see the rising horror in Rupert's eyes as the night wears on. And he pieces it all together. Right. And you see the disintegration of Philip through the night, who is falling apart and crumbling, which I think is really interesting because he's the one who's actually strangling. When you see the beginning, mm -hmm. Philip's hold, Brandon's holding up David being murdered, and it's right. Philip who's killing him. Right. You know? And so Philip is the one who is, dis and especially when he has Mrs. Uh, Mrs. No, not Mrs. Atwater. Um, and of no, course, he knows. That was Atwater, the sister, the, the psychic. It was his uh, sister, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. It was Mr. Atwater's sister, not his wife, because his wife right. is. But, um, you know, sh she makes the reference about his hands will bring him great fortune. And of course, he's a pianist. Most mm -hmm. people would think, oh, that's what she's talking about. But we all know from the very beginning, it was his hands that committed the murder. So you have that disintegration of Philip. There is very the little doubt that Brandon was the mastermind. Right. And Brandon is the cool, calm, collected, aloof above it all. Yet with Rupert being in the room, he really feels a challenge to get mm -hmm. over this night with Rupert being there and not finding out anything. Well, and I think it's a, the it's best, a game. Yeah. And I think the best part in the film, there's two, two sequences that I absolutely love. Um, thir a third one, but it's inconsequential. The, the, fir the first one I love is when, after the murders happen, and you see Brandon walk with a rope, and he goes into the kitchen, and it's a long shot. The camera is still rooted where the murder took place. And you see Brandon walk away into the kitchen. The door swings open. You see him pull out the drawer and he drops the rope in a kitchen drawer and the door closes. So you see it in a swinging door action. So you get that element of build. Later on, as the dinner party concludes, you see Brandon has tied a set of books he's giving Mr. Atwater the first edition books he's going to give him and it's tied with the rope that killed his son uh well so david and his dad's last name was kentley oh kentley and i'm sorry At atwater was his sister uh, but i was the, assuming that was, was a married sister, name right. okay very good thank you thank you for correcting me on that um but he took the books wrapped in tied up with the rope oh, yeah. that had killed his son yeah no the mastermind got rid of the murder weapon by giving the murder weapon to the father <laughs> right <laughs> nothing, exactly nothing creepy about that I know. And then the whole thing that I loved, my favorite part of the whole film, is the argument or the discussion, the intense discussion that occurs off camera while you see Mrs. Wilson, their maid, slowly clearing off. She goes back and forth, taking items off of the chest. And there are books that are supposed to be put back in the chest. So the whole time you hear this intense conversation going on off camera, and all you see is this action of her slowly getting to the point where the reveal of the body is about to happen, only to have Brandon swoop in at the last minute. Um, that is my favorite moment in the entire sequence. Um, I think it's a brilliant film. It's one of my all-time favorites. I've watched it many, 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 many times. Um, although you wouldn't know it because I couldn't remember half the people's names. That's just getting old. That's all that is. <laughs> but um, I think it was brilliantly cast. I love the cast. Um, I loved the premise. Um, I, like Hitch, I love these dark, kind of twisted, convoluted things. Uh, I, I like characters that are deeply flawed and you watch things fall apart or 
you know, to see if they will make it through to the end. And, and in many respects, they almost get there. They almost get there. And then Rupert makes a return, feigning he lo left his cigarette case. And the real truth becomes revealed. Um, it's an intense film. I think it is a beautifully done film. Before we get to our ratings, though, I do want to say there are other queer-coded movies from Hitchcock's library. Um, starting with the one that is probably the funniest is from the 1938 um, movie The Lady Vanishes, of which there is an, a gay couple, a couple of English gentlemen, who... Uh, because they're uh, they're stranded inside inside of a alpine lodge with a very bad snowstorm. The only room they can have is shared with the maid that is in this little alpine lodge, and she's a young woman and she's obviously interested in the two English gentlemen who very clearly do not want to have anything to do with her. So it's another queer coded relationship. And what's really great about it is that they act like a married couple. They, but they're not effeminate. They both are into sports. And towards the end, they are in a shootout and they're actually firing guns. And so, so these gay male couple who are very clearly queer coded, it, it, they're, they're not the effeminate kind of thing. And it was Hitch's way in 1938 of pushing a queer relationship that to him was normal. So there's that one. Um, in Rebecca, we have Mrs. Danvers, played by the brilliant and wonderful Dame Judith Anderson, who is a servant who is slightly overly enamored with the first wife who is no longer on the scene. It's also covered in Celluloid Closet, which we have the review, and I'll put it back up there again. Um, so there's that one. Um, Psycho has a Anthony Perkins, who was probably a complete conflicted homosexual because he did have a relationship with Tab Hunter for many years and then disavowed all of that. Ended up dying of AIDS. It was a very sad story. But he plays this kind of queer-coded mama's boy character who only kills women, women that he perceives to be uh, loose and fancy-free. So there's that one. And then lastly, um, Strangers on a Train, again with Farley Granger, uh, where... Um, Bruno, the, uh, played by the wonderful, brilliant Robert Walker, um, picks up uh, Farley Granger's character of Guy Haynes, who's a tennis pro, on a train, and they meet by brushing their legs against each other, and then a very intimate sort of conversation happens between two stranger men, men who don't know each other, but the conversation becomes intimate very quickly. Um, and that's another gay-coded um, movie you can watch too, uh, Strangers on a Train. I will put all of the links to those movies or the titles down in the description so people can, wa you know, watch them at their leisure and see some more of Hitchcock's queer coding in action. Um, also, before we get to the ratings, we have swag that we are offering in our store. Um, so I'm going to throw, throw up a couple of photos up here so you can see some of the designs I put together for a rope podcast. If you're so inclined, we would love it if you would purchase and wear them and let people know about what we do. We really would appreciate it. I have two lines currently up, which is the Pride 2021 Queer Author line, which has quotes attributed to the queer authors we've chosen, one for each color in the rainbow flag. And we also have a drag U line, which are drag queens throwing shade. So we have some humorous ones and some not not necessarily serious, but just some really um, uh, celebratory. Classic. Yeah, celebratory of, of queer authors. So uh, be sure to check those out. And lastly, if you enjoy what we do with the Rope Podcast reviews and the interviews, please like, subscribe and comment down below. It really helps us with the algorithms. Um, get your friends to subscribe, tell them what we're up to and what we do. Um, we would really enjoy this to become a conversation between our viewers and the movies that we review. We want to know your thoughts on these films and these works. So with that, let's get to the ratings. Why don't you go ahead and start it off? Well, do you mind if I consult the stars first and take a guess that you might perhaps give it fives across the board? Is that going to be Yeah, that's or... why I'm having you go first. Yeah, I figured. All right. Overall production. I gave it a four. I enjoyed it very much. It's very well done. 
script screenplay, 4.5. It was witty. It was intelligent. Um, there's some obvious understanding of human psychology behind it. Definitely one of the highlights of the film, believe it or not. Sound lighting score, give it a 3.5. Didn't knock my socks off. It wasn't Hitch's best use of light that I've seen because um, he does often use light as a character and it just didn't... This, this one didn't call for it, so it wasn't there. Interestingly enough, though, the cloud sequence in the background, oh, yeah. that was all done live and it was done over time. And in fact, from what I heard, he filmed that whole ending sequence like five times because he couldn't get the color just right in the, in the skyline. So anyways, go ahead. All right. Uh, still gave sound lighting score 3.5. This wasn't the film for Hitch to show those off necessarily. Art direction costuming for, I mean, period piece. Everybody was dressed appropriately. Yeah, you can't uh, get much more contemporary than yeah, the I know. time. <laughs> I know, I'm like, eh. I mean, it didn't stand out. It was very well done. Four. Uh, casting, five. The cast pulled this off. And I, even in light of what you said about James Stewart's comments about who should have been cast in that role, I still think he pulled it off. Direction, 4.5. I Now, I, that may change in my head because now that I know Hitch was up against some producer problems... Um, but yeah, 4.5. Queer themes presented three. It's coded. It's hidden. They had a relationship. This film wasn't really about that. So personal overall rating of four. Okay. Mine are generally fives across the board. The only one that I'll pull back on um, is the, the sound lighting score, and it's mostly for the score. However, mm -hmm. um, I became so earwiggy over that piano piece, I had to find out what it was called and then go buy the damn thing so I could play it in the house so I could get the theme out of my head. So it's by Palenque. <laughs> I'll put the link down below in case if you watch the movie and it gets stuck in your head and you feel the same need, I'm going to put a link down below where you could find the damn thing. Because <laughs> I had to go look for it when we didn't have the internet. <laughs> so... That's uh, it for Rote Reviews for this week. Next week, we are going to actually pull a review that we never put up because we were in the process of signing our agreement with SAG after to do this run of the series. And we had recorded late last year, around this time last year. Until next week, this is S.A. Bass Collins. And Van Sebastian. Saying, saying we'll see you at the movies. Bring your popcorn and shield your eyes sometimes. It's okay to not watch the murders. It's really okay to not watch the murders. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone. Bye now. Bye. Oh, what's that? Closing time. The bums rush and melody, dear.